So this is the Herbright Institute. I've been here before, but I didn't I didn't come here for the specifically to talk about Herbright Institute. I just happened to be near near the area and came and had a look. But since looking, I've done I look looked into what they do here and what's happened. I just want to bring you an interesting story from uh, about 10 years ago. So it's an old story, but uh, I found it sort of interesting and intriguing. I never knew about it until I read about it and uh, it affects this local area in Surrey. So I thought I'd uh, bring it up. And if I'm interested in it, hopefully somebody else finds it interesting. Perbright Institute is a, a limited company and a registered charity. It receives grants from the BBSRC, which is the Biotechnical and Biological Services, uh, Biological Sciences Research Council, which is part of UK Research and Innovation, a non-departmental public body, also known as Quangos, I think. UKRI is sponsored by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the BEIS which uh, has a 12 billion budget. So Perbright receives grants from the BBSRC, uh, a core grant is known as, as well as other grants from the BBSRC and other government agencies and other industries. It also has income from private work and research it performs. In 2018, the core grant from BBSRC was 15.3 million. That was the core grant and 4 million in research grants, another 15.5 million in other grants. Uh, this is all from their own uh, accounting and their own finances available online. Uh, another 10 million from other research grants it's listed as, uh, which is about 45 million in donations they're classed as. Now th the story relates to 2007. I'll, get, I'll give you a little timeline of the story. So on the 2nd of August, a vet was called to Wolford Farm in Surrey. Animals were showing symptoms of uh, FMD or foot and mouth disease. Samples were taken the next day because it was too late apparently for the vet at the time. It was, uh, you know, getting on in the evening. So she came back the next day and samples were taken and sent here to Purbright for analysis. The next day, DEFRA was informed that foot and mouth was detected and it was publicly announced. So an immediate national livestock movement ban was imposed, a three kilometer protection zone or a PZ and a 10 kilometer surveillance zone, SZ, was set up around the farm. 4th of August, the infected animals were culled at IP1 which is infected premises number one. At the same time as this happening, investigators at Purbright invent identified the strain of FMD, or foot and mouth disease. I'm going to call it FMD, it's a lot easier. Which is uh, 0I or 01 BFS 1860. If anyone's uh, scientific out there is interested in the, in the, uh, in the correct strain. Now, the only, the only UK location known to hold this strain and therefore to be the likely source of the outbreak was Purbright itself. So it's a bit worrying when they're investigating a strain and find out that that strain could only have come out from their own facility. The government immediately started two independent reviews into biosecurity at Purbright and other UK facilities in general. On the 6th of August, a nearby farm, a second farm, was diagnosed also as having foot and mouth disease, IP2. By now, all UK exports had been banned, not just national livestock movements, but all UK exports were banned. The next day, 7th of August, the, an independent review by the HSE, Health and Safety executive concluded Purbright could continue operations provided it followed rigorous biosecurity protocols. 23rd of August, Deprovets reported to the EU that the outbreak had been contained. 7th of September, the two independent reports concluded that the virus 
had most likely leaked from a drainage pipe here at the Purbright Institute. Contaminated the surrounding soil and carried away on vehicles, much like possibly that might have happened, you know. That's the sort of thing that might have happened. A vehicle coming in and out of the site, drove over the contaminated ground and then spread the disease that way into the proximity of the IP1 location. 8th of September, the Chief Veterinary Officer, or CVO, declared that the disease was over. Three days later, sorry, four days later, on the 11th of September, another case was reported. And this was outside of the, or just outside, the six kilometer uh, SZ surveillance zone of IP2, the second infected uh, premises. The next day, after that case was reported, FMD was confirmed and the animals at this IP3 site were culled. 15th of September, another site identified, IP4. Two days later, two days later on the 17th of September, IP5 was identified, six kilometers away from IP2. So as you can see, that all these sites were, you know, in close proximity to each other. Three further infected premises were found, with the final case being on the 30th of September 2007. And yet again, apparently on the 19th of November, foot and mouth disease was again released into the, the site's drainage system, although it, it didn't escape from the site itself. Now this was a result of a, of a faulty valve at the Merial Vaccine Manufacturing Plant, which is along there. I'm not sure if it's that building there or behind the yellow building. I'll have a little walk down there as well because it's, it's right next to the site. And the, the two are linked. It's now not Merrill. It's been bought out by someone else. Uh, I can't remember the name. Earring. Uh, no, I can't remember it. Can't pronounce it so you'll see in a minute anyway. So the leak was contained due to improvements imposed by the Secretary of State, uh, improvements of the drains imposed by the Secretary of State as part of the relicensing conditions of the Merrill plant after the Health and Safety Executive made its investigation. Now, interesting to note that the official report states that there have been 14 outbreaks since 1960 that have been attributed to escapes of foot and mouth disease from research institutes. So 14 outbreaks since 1960 of, uh, of foot and mouth disease from research places. It appears from the report into the outbreak that traces of the virus were found in a pipe that ran from the Merial plant to the treatment plant in Purbright Institute next door. The virus could survive the initial citric acid disinfection stage at the Merial plant the effluent system then took the waste to the final caustic soda treatment plant. It was this part of the system that had not been regularly inspected and there was evidence of leakage from broken pipes and also unsealed overflowing manholes. I read somewhere else that these, these pipes and drainage system was like over, over 80 years old and weren't regularly inspected. Now, despite these findings, the, the County Council's legal team uh, advised that prosecution of either of the two labs is not possible. This was because the commissioned reports were unable to pinpoint the exact source of the outbreak. So no legal proceedings were brought. It was, it was too hard, basically, to prove beyond doubt that DEFRA had breached their license conditions as the two labs shared the drainage system under those conditions. So there was no legal action from, uh, from authorities. The, the farms that were directly affected had animals culled, I believe did bring a civil, I uh, did sue them and bring a civil case which was settled out of court. There was also a second group of farmers who tried to bring a, uh, tried to sue based on the fact that their livelihood was affected by the livestock ban on movement. Uh, this was unsuccessful, which probably is not surprising because else, if that was the case, it would open it up to every farmer in the country 
being able to sue for loss of earnings based on a complete livestock ban, a, a complete livestock movement ban. So I'm not surprised that people who were not directly affected by the uh, by the outbreak weren't offered any uh, any damages of any sort. On a photographic note, there were two photographers who were found guilty under the Animal Health Act for ignoring prohibitions and entering protected sites. One was fined £2,000 with £5,000 costs and the other was given £1,150 fine and 140 hours uh, community service. Uh, Meriel was acquired by Boehringer Inghelm. Ingelheim, sorry, Bowlinger Ingelheim in January 2007 and that's who's next door now. Now in 2012 and 2013 they were also prosecuted for failures in safety management related to pressure systems that keep airborne particles being drawn into filters for cleaning. Apparently they changed operating procedures without proper planning and assessment and uh, that led to occasions where the required level of negative air pressure was not maintained although neither incident uh, resulted in any any release of uh, foot and mouth and disease so as you can see there's a construction going on on site at the moment demolition and construction site so obviously building new facilities there and I'm just going to walk next door to the uh, to the once what was the Merial site this guy's just shouted at me hello he said I'll be polite and say hello back oh and the and the uh, people drove by and took a picture of me there so Howdy. Are you referring anything to the site? Yes. What is that for? For me, I'm doing a story. You cannot take a picture to the site? I can, you're misinformed. So you're not allowed to take any picture in there? I am. From public, I can take pictures of anything I can see. No, you see. can take outside, but not inside. It's no, no. Recording. Right, yeah, fine, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. good. This is recording as well. Anyway, if I'm standing on public property, yep. I can take pictures of anything. Yeah. And you are from? I'm not, I'm from, what do you mean, from? You're from, where, where are you from? I'm not from any, I'm... Yeah, but you're taking the, that's the government property. Yeah, I realise that, that's, why, so I, that's why I'm here, to do a story on the government property. So what, what are you doing, what are you actually taking? I'm taking pictures, yeah. and then telling a story at the same time about the Purbright Institute. What, what, are, what are you telling about the Purbright Institute? You need, if you're taking any pictures, yeah. basically you need to authorise from Institute. I, I don't, not from public, I don't. When, I, when I'm standing on public property, uh -huh. I, you don't need permission from anyone to take pictures. But plus this one is the pro of, um, uh, public institute private property. You are not allowed to anybody... Even I, even I'm not on your private property, I'm on public property. But you're taking on-site picture? Yes. Inside one? Yes. I, Maybe you're taking my picture too? Yes. You're in public. There's, there's no expectation of privacy. When people are in public, mm -hmm. there's no expectation of privacy. That's, that's how people can have cameras on their houses yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know. So okay. there's, there's no problem. It's, when, when you, no, when that, some... there is a problem in institute. In institute, they, they have a rule, they are on rules. They yeah, are... that's their rules. Yeah. Okay, they're that's why to... I'm not taking pictures on their site. I'm not okay. going on their site. Yeah, they've can got you rules. Can you hold on? I'll call somebody in. Yeah, come here. Yeah. Oh, well, wait over there with you. Come on. What, what was your name? I'm Shikilgo. You can see me in here. Okay, you got your SIA badge. That's good. But you don't want to give your name? No. Okay. So you came all the way out onto public property. You get asked to uh, get it. Can you please um, uh, call Jason and you and Jason come down to the main gate house in Trent? <sighs> You can't take my mind picture, that's my privacy. 
No, that, I, I just no, no, did. You're not, you're, not to, you're, you're not allowed to take my picture. I've just explained. You're not, you're not allowed to take my picture. What law is that? That's off in it. That's my choice. That's your choice. It's yeah, not yet. But, but you cannot take my picture. I've just. You can, you can take anything else, but not me. Do you, do, would you like me to explain or no, not? Okay, if you don't want to hear me, then I won't talk. That's my not choice. Okay. You don't get a choice when no, you're in no, when you you're in public. Oh, okay, I don't want to talk. That's about my it. privacy. Seems to be a problem with expectation of privacy and the understanding of that uh, today. So if I, if I don't want to be photographed walking down the street, I can go up to McDonald's or the pub and ask them to turn off the CCTV because I don't want to be photographed. That seems to be the logic behind it. But unfortunately, that's not the case. But I've tried explaining it, but... What security company do you work for? G4S. Ah, G4S, yeah. Is this a security guy that's coming out as well? Yeah, head of security. Okay, cool. Yeah, basically, What about when Google Maps drive by? Oh, well, I do. They take pictures. As they drive by, they take pictures. In fact, if I go onto Google Maps, I can see everything above. Yeah? Did you question them and tell them they can't? Well, you can't do anything about this either. I'm on, you know, it's the same. <laughs> That's it. Create some privacy. Just, that's, just hold on a yeah, no, that's fine. You you create some privacy. So I was I was halfway down that path there, perhaps where that uh, uh, telephone box or electricity box and the pylon are the telephone pylon when this security guard came out walked to about this bus stop, maybe a little bit further and shouted hello at me and just at that same time and I paused the camera while I was walking down to the uh, the uh, other plant next door a couple of guys in a car pulled up I didn't really get a chance to look at them because I was looking at the security guard and answering him and uh, he leaned out his window and took a snap which is fine, I'm, I'm no problem with that at all, I don't care. Uh, so yes, he came out on public property, walked quite away <laughs> to me and accosted me, well, you know, not accosted me, but, you know, said hello in a nice friendly manner, it wasn't, he wasn't aggressive or nasty in his approach, but I, I had the option, I could have just ignored him and gone on my merry way, but as usual, I'm interested to see, to see what they've got to say. I mean, there's a bus stop here, 
I mean, you can't really get more public than the bus. I, I could, I could, I could be standing waiting for a bus. Really, I might, I might, I might just wait for the bus. So, we're having a little chat. Hopefully, they'll get it sorted out. Oh look, I'm probably on CCTV there. Shall I ask if they can uh, turn it off for my my privacy, please? Ah, oh, okay. They, they seem to have uh, come back in and may, maybe sorted out that I'm actually not doing anything wrong. <laughs> and they best poodle off. So, again, I know people criticise me for saying, oh, he was nice enough. No, he wasn't. He's a security guard and he came and approached him. Yeah, okay, but he was nice enough how he did that, you know, apart from him not wanting to uh, discuss the <laughs> privacy in public issue, but, you know, there's no point trying to argue with someone at the time. I mean, perhaps now he's understood and uh, has been educated abs of sorts. He'll understand that while out in the public street, they've got no... Uh, no authority to do anything really, so anyway I'm going to wait here by the bus stop this time. Oh no, I tell you what, I forgot I was going to go next door to the uh, to the next site. I wander off there. Okay, so this, this is about a hundred yards up the road. In the Bollinger Ingelheim, which was once once merry all health. So this this was the old merry all health, and it was from here that the pipeline led underground. Next door, and you can just about see next door the uh, red brick building in the background there. So the red brick building behind there, I think, is part of the Perbright Institute, and. Uh, so the, these have got a, a shared facility, shall we say. Or uh, well, they used to. I, I don't know whether it's changed since, since that outbreak many years ago. Uh, perhaps it's that yellow pipeline there. No, that doesn't look eight years old, so... <laughs> So, there we go, anyway, that's the old... I don't know whether the building's new or the building's changed, but... That's the old Merial Institute. Now, Boringa Ingelheim. Oh. So you can see, it's literally next door. We happen to have fallen upon a situation here with more army cutbacks being highlighted. Look, there's a Land Rover here, some army guys in it, and they've broken down. <laughs> broken down in their Land Rover. I've got a spot spot, a soft spot for Landy's. But, having said that, uh, being used by the army, 
it's uh, not the best vehicle in, in certain situations. Famously, they were replaced, the uh, Snatch Land Rover led to a lot of uh, deaths, just wasn't protected enough when they first started using them out in Afghanistan. The, the protection that they had put on them was pretty awful, it was just some ballistic material on the outside. Again, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. And that's what made uh, the MOD buy in a load of new vehicles, especially the Jackal vehicle. If you go on Google, have a look at the Jackal vehicle. That was pretty much bought in to replace the uh, Snatch Land Rovers that they've been using for many years in Northern Ireland, I believe. But it offered no protection from IEDs, whereas the uh, Jackal vehicle had some uh, mine protection. It was uh, heavily armoured underneath uh, to protect from the initial explosion and also it had in it uh, some blast mitigating seats. Now what that means is that what was happening with a lot of vehicles when they were hitting IEDs, the the initial explosion would be contained with the mine resistant armour underneath. A lot of the time it's a V-shaped hull underneath vehicles which obviously deflects the explosion to either side rather than the, the sort of the bottom of the vehicle taking the full brunt of the explosion itself. But what was happening was although the initial explosion was being suppressed as it were the uh, the vehicle would go flying up in the air and there would be a slam down event it's known as so when the vehicle came back down and crashed down to the floor a lot of the occupants were suffering spinal injuries uh, ankle injuries foot injuries uh, from the impact so it wasn't actually the explosion which hurt them it was the uh, as I say, the slam down event that was causing injuries. That's not to say they weren't injuries from the explosion, but there are a lot of injuries from the slam down event. So what these seats did is they had blast mitigation in them, which meant they would absorb the impact of the initial explosion and then they would reset themselves so that when the vehicle came down onto the floor again they would also absorb that impact so they had a double effect so it basically not only protected yourself when you're going up from the initial explosion it also protected you when you uh, slammed back down to earth and there were far less foot ankle spinal neck injuries being caused by that that's not to say that say that there were there were deaths of soldiers in the jackal vehicle, which it did under, come under criticism. But my understanding is that it actually was quite well liked. Maybe some uh, ex ex army dudes will tell me. I mean, it might not have been perfect, but it was. It was better than what they had. Anyway, I'm going to go look, look around the uh, common here.